at the top of the hour. So good afternoon. I am Kimberly Wickert from the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute in Retain, Kentucky. Thank you all for spending some time with us today. We will be sharing our objectives right now, which are how to um, define social determinants of health and you will hear what social determinant barriers are as well as resolutions to those barriers in the workplace. And finally, you will hear the keys to promoting social determinant success in the workplace. A few housekeeping items this morning. Um, we welcome your input. So if you have any questions or comments, please put those in the chat and we'll be monitoring those as we go along. We also have a poll that we will be asking you to complete here in a few seconds. If you would just answer those questions, um, we would appreciate it. And um, this information is available. You can choose to um, view the closed captions in your view if you would like to. We will be sharing this recording on our Retain Kentucky Media website following the presentation today. So if you'd like to revisit it or share it with someone else, um, please do so. So today I am very excited to have um, two of our presenters kick off our employment seminar series for 2022 with me. And joining us are Michelle Graham Smith, who is one of our retained senior return to work coordinators, also with the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. And Michelle has a bachelor's degree in social work, as well as a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling. She's a certified rehab counselor. She's also licensed in social work and a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor in Kentucky. She brings seven years of experience working with adolescents as well as adults who have mental health and substance abuse disorders, co-occurring disorders, and she provides case management, family dynamic support, as well as transitional care plans. And she's been in the field of case management advocating for individuals with various disabilities for over 15 years. So. Michelle, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, sharing a little bit of your expertise. I know we're all excited to hear what you have to share. Along with Michelle is Amy Rumbrell, who leads our Return to Work Coordinator team at Retain Kentucky, um, also the Human Development Institute at the University of Kentucky. So she is our Return to Work Coordinator Supervisor and Amy, too, is a certified rehab counselor and has been in the field for 18 years, working with people with various disabilities, helping them enter the workforce or return to work, providing case management services, vocational evaluations, coordinating transitional work placements, as well as career exploration, job seeking skills training, job development, and job placement. So, um, I'm really glad to have Amy here as well. And, and thank you for agreeing to kick off the seminar with me today as well. I know um, we're all excited to hear what you have to share about overcoming social determinant barriers in the workforce. So with um, that, I will share that I'm Kimberly Wickert. And for anybody who's joined the employment seminar series before, um, you know that I'm the Director of Organizational Partnerships at Retain. I too join uh, Michelle and Amy in being a certified rehab counselor as well. So we're gonna start by looking at the definition of social determinants and the US Department of Health and Human Services has defined social determinants of health. And you might see that um, abbreviated as SDOH as conditions in the environments where people are born, live, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Social determinants of health can impact our ability to not only work, but to be successful in the workplace. And I've recently spoken with employers who have identified social determinant barriers as reasons why workers aren't able to come to work. And that's why I asked Amy and Michelle 
to share specifics about how the retain team and return to work coordinators can help someone overcome social determinant barriers to be able to be successful at work. Not only will this give us a glimpse specific to overcoming those social determinant barriers, but it's also going to provide us a snapshot of how retain return to work coordinators have actively done so for workers and their employers. So let's hear from Michelle, who's going to start us off and elaborate on types of social determinants. Okay, so one of the first things we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about income and social status. Higher income and social status are linked to better health. The greater the gap between the richest and poorest people, the greater the difference in health. Um, high income can impact level of education availability, social status within the community, and knowledge of resources available. Income and social status can impact time of diagnosis, treatment, which has an impact on the ability to work when a diagnosis does occur. The next one is going to be the physical environment, which is going to be safe water, clean air, healthy workplace, safe houses, communities, and roads all contribute to good health. With the physical environment can impact overall ability to work if you live in a community with limited transportation options, if there is no neighborhood store, access to neighborhood parks, safety and security in your neighborhood, long-term exposure to negative environments can have a significant impact on your health. Living in a community that lacks essential services and supports can lead to stress and can lead to negative health and employment outcomes. The next one is going to be health services, access and use of services that prevent and treat disease influences health. Of the estimated 150 million Americans participating in employer-sponsored health plans, 24% are considered underinsured, which means that they have coverage but don't have financial resources to afford their plan's high out-of-pocket expenses. Next slide, please. The next one we're going to talk about is going to be social support networks. Greatest support from families and friends and communities are linked to better health. Culture, customs and traditions, and the beliefs of the family and community all affect health. When difficulties arise, do you have a social network that you can depend on? If, you go, if your car breaks down, if you need childcare, or you have difficulties with another area in life, do you have a support to help you through this time? Genetics inheritance plays a part in determining lifespan, healthiness, and likelihood of developing certain illnesses. Personal behaviors and coping skills, balanced eating, keeping active, smoking, drinking, and how we deal with life stresses and challenges all affect health. Genetic factors for overall health or employment engagement, having the knowledge to know risk factors and ability to receive care, have an impact on diagnosis and ability to fully engage in the workforce. The next one's going to be gender. Men and women suffer from different types of diseases in different ages. So being able to have the knowledge about whether or not I'm at risk for something, the ability to receive care and have an impact on a diagnosis and the ability to fully engage in the workforce. Next slide, please. Environmental and social factors. If you do not have a safety plan or net to lay your head head down at night and rest, your overall health and mental stability can be impacted. Social factors can impact overall employee engagement, overall ability to work and mental health when you feel connected and supported, the ability to fully engage in employment improves. Reducing health inequalities, access and use of services to prevent and treat disease influence health and overall ability to work. Research and social determinants have shown that medical care accounts for only 10 to 20% of health outcomes, while 80 to 90% of outcomes are a result of in environmental and social factors. Next slide. Prolonged exposure to negative environment can have a significant impact on your health and work status. It becomes increasingly difficult to, for workers to function in a community that has scarce resources in order to connect with. So if you're unable to connect with the resources, if you don't have transportation to get back and forth to the resources, or you don't know where to look, it makes it really difficult for you to be able to connect with those resources, go to work, be able to fully function while at work. Next slide, please. I think to here, we're gonna um, toss it to Amy, but thanks Michelle for providing that 
foundation about why social determinants matter. So Amy's going to transition and talk specifically about social determinants and how they impact work life. Thank you, Kimberly. The social determinants impacting work life that retained participants most commonly experience are listed here. These could have been barriers before the particip participant's injury or illness, or they could have become barriers as they plan to stay at or return to work. The first is transportation. In order for a participant to stay at or return to work, he or she must be able to get to and from work. The participant may need help identifying, applying for, or coordinating transportation options. The second is caregiving. In preparation for retained participants returning to work, they're often responsible for coordinating caregiving for children, elderly family members, or pets. Therefore, participants will need to review and set up options for caregiving. The third are shelter and utilities. Before someone returns to work, it's essential that they have a safe living environment. Participants can be assisted to keep an existing shelter option or find a new option. Keeping utilities such as electric, water, gas, telephone, and internet on is important for a participant's health, well-being, and comfort. The fourth is food security, which includes making sure the participant has food, either prepared food or groceries. The fifth is clothing, which includes per personal clothing and clothing that the participant will need once he or she returns to work. If any of these social determinant areas are lacking, it can negatively impact a participant's ability to return to work. Now let's look specifically at these six determinants impacting work life. The first one is transportation. Transportation can be impacted by a participant's medical condition or medications. For instance, if a participant sustained a neurological impairment such as a stroke, he or she may not be able to drive for a period of time. So transportation will need to be arranged for the participant to attend doctors and therapy appointments, to travel into the community to get supplies or to get to work. Also, certain medications list precautions of driving while taking them, such as fatigue, impaired judgment, concentration, and reaction times. Another transportation consideration is the cost of automobile repairs. A participant may have access to a car, but will need, it will need to be fixed in order to use it. Next is the lack of finances in order to be able to afford a vehicle or pay for a transportation service. If a participant has not received their short-term disability payments or their application for transportation services based on their injury or illness has not been approved, they may need to figure out how they will pay for transportation. Another transportation barrier is the location where the participant lives. Participants who live in rural or remote locations do not have the same transportation options as those who live in urban areas. The participant may need help with knowing what transportation options are in their area. Public transportation can be an option. Retain uh, can help participants to figure out their transportation options. Transportation resources that Retain has access to assist participants, including TARC or a free downtown trolley in the Louisville area or Lextran in the Lexington area. Retain coordinators have experience accessing applications and schedules for participants to provide them customized information for their needs. Another transportation resource is Scoop, an app that helps HR and workers in a company to carpool and organize schedules for individuals traveling in the same direction. Rideshare programs led by employees are another helpful resource. Employees can coordinate to take turns driving and picking up other employees in their area to travel to and from work. Rideshare services such as Lyft and Uber are options for individuals, especially in remote areas where other public transportation options are not available. Other considerations to assist with transportation are the opportunity for a participant to work, to work remotely for part or all of the time, as well as working flexible schedules and changing shifts in order to open up more transportation options for them. Next slide, please. 
caregiving. The second social determinant barrier, barrier we'll talk about is caregiving. Participants often need to arrange childcare. The participant may have had childcare arrangements in place before their injury or illness, but circumstances have changed, such as the availability of childcare providers, money to pay childcare providers, and work shift changes requiring them to find another provider. Other caregiving considerations are elder care for a parent or family member, care for both children and elderly family members called the sandwich generation, and needs for pet for care that allow flexibility, such as if a participant needs to attend appointments outside of work, such as going to the doctor or physical or occupational therapy. Caregiving resources include employer on-site facilities, options for where the child can go during sickness, online and phone apps that arrange child, elder, and pet care. Also, the Human Development Institute's Child Care Aware Program and website helps individuals to identify child care options and benefits that can be used for payment of those options. Other options for child care include the participant's ability to do remote work, work a flexible schedule or change shifts so that the work schedule can align with child care availability. Another option is if the participant receives Medicaid, a family member could get paid for being the participant's child care provider. The next, the next barriers or um, social determinants are shelter and utilities. Homelessness and stable housing are essential needs. And this is an area that should be attended to first for participants. Community resources such as shelters that are available to, to provide participants a shelter and a home, we can find out what the instructions and parameters are for that shelter and, and provide that information to the participant. COVID relief programs have included rent and mortgage assistance and participants have been able to be provided the information about these programs. Utility bill assistance programs are available to individuals who are behind in paying bills and are sponsored by nonprofit organizations. Arrangements can also be made with utility companies to spread payments over time. Another uh, assistance is federal government sponsored cell phones, which are a way for participants to qualify for a free phone if they're not able to keep their cell phone operating. I'm gonna give you a second to take a breath, Amy. That's a lot of really great information um, and, and options to overcome those social determinant barriers. So thank you. I know um, we've shared a lot of information and just um, wanna give people a, a snapshot of a specific success story that you're gonna outline that um, our return to work coordinator worked with an individual. So hopefully you got a second there to take a breath and <laughs> I'm gonna give it back to you. Thank you. As Kimberly mentioned, here is a success story that illustrate retains help to a participant who was experiencing transportation, shelter and food barriers. This participant was working full time when he needed to go on to medical leave. He was not able to pay his rent and car payments since he was receiving disability payments that were 60% of his regular pay. The retained coordinator helped him access an eviction prevention program sponsored by the Jefferson County Court System that set up a collaboration with the participant's landlord and justice system caseworker to request an extension. The extent the participant was also behind on his car loan and risked repossession of the vehicle. The coordinator contacted the car dealership to find out options and the participant provided pay stubs to get an extension on his car payment so that he could keep his car. Now Michelle will share how we connected this participant to local food banks. So um, the individual participant that we are talking with there actually had two underage children that was living in the household. And so we were able to connect him with the local food banks, but also the food services that was offered through the school services here locally. But one of the things to remember is that geography can impact 
the access to fresh and healthy food. When looking for resources to help with, to assist with food insecurities, you can reach out to local community food banks. Is there a neighborhood place, a one-stop shop that may be able to help with some of the other social determinants that are going on? What days of the week are they open on? And then what is the criteria for them? So it's important to be able to know some of that information. Many of the food banks will allow you to get a food box either weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. And so being able to know and be able to connect them with those resources are really important. There's also going to be employer-based food banks. Um, I have worked with employers who have had food banks available to their employers, whether it's a box or a cabinet that they keep kind of general food in that can be made quickly, backpacks kind of laying around. So whenever the employees pick those up and they take them, it's not something that's obvious that that's what they're doing. When you're able to eat and have a meal while you're at work, you're able to be more active and attentive to what is going on around you. There are going to be meal programs that can be offered throughout the community. We can help assist them with finding out what, what places in the area offer fresh hot meals during the week. What time of day do they offer them? Uh, what is the distance from their house? Is it going to be walkable for them to get there? Is there public transportation that can help them get there if not? And do they have the time and the health in order for them to get back and forth to that? There's going to be some grocery assistance that's going to be offered through a lot of the community resources that are provided in the area. It's important to know what their services are, but normally if you live within a certain geographical area, they will be able to help with that. And then of course, SNAP benefits. Those are one of those that uh, retain coordinators actually help with. We can assist in filling out the applications. We can assist in uh, submitting the information if they need that and just kind of help them understand what the income uh, limitations are, what it is that they need to do to get those. Next slide, please. With clothing uh, resources, there's a lot of clothing resources that are available in the area. So we wanna look at what kind of community programs are available. Is there, as I said, one of those one-stop shops available that can help with clothing, help with a voucher to go out and um, buy clothing. Maybe you need something that's for warm weather. Maybe you need something, a specific dress for your um, work. There's a lot of community resources that can help for that. There's actually a program called Dress for Success that uh, serves certain areas and you can contact them. They help you find professional attire, uh, clothes that may be able to help you for an interview, certain things that may be needed. So being able to connect with those is really important. There's going to be employer uniform safety equipment. Does your employer connect with the service provider that will offer a discount? Um, is there a place that you can do payroll deduction to help pay for that? And then it goes into the upcycling and thrifting for work clothes as well. Is there a goodwill around you that may have options? Is there somebody that works there that maybe they have some uniforms that may not fit them? What are the uniforms? Is it uh, khakis? Is it just a dress shirt? What are those things? And so being able to go instead of buying new, let's see what's available in some of the thrift stores or let's see what's available that may be able to help you with that. There's also gonna be some platforms on social media that you can go and you can say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. There's people that can give those things to you for free um, depending on what's going on. Next slide, please. There are many tools that Retain uses to help participants with social determinants. Here are a few. We use the Unitas online platform that allows coordinators to review information about resources our participants need, as well as make referrals to agencies on behalf of our participants. Coordinators review and provide information on a variety of resources from the Kentucky Disability Resource Guide located on HDI's website. Most importantly, the use of our case management process to identify participants' social determinant needs is at the core of our assistance. Retain coordinators communicate weekly with participants to ask important questions regarding their changing social determinant needs. Coordinators jump into action to research and refer participants to the best resources to overcome their barriers. We see firsthand the importance of solving social determinant needs on the timely and positive outcomes for our participants in returning to work. So what can employers do? 
uh, paid leave policies. One of the most vital things that employers can do is have clear communication with the employees about what benefits are available and the eligibility criteria. For FMLA, some employers have the 12 month waiting period that they need to be employed, short term and long term disability, paid time off and paid leave. What is the criteria for that? Who do they need to communicate with in order for them to find out what benefits they're eligible for? Who is their benefit provider? It's important to communicate the expectations to the employees while navigating the injury and illness. Who is it that they turn their medical documentation into? Do they turn it into the work? Do they turn it into their disability provider, short-term disability, long-term disability, or they, do they turn that into both? So being able to communicate those expectations are vital. And then the next one is going to be employee assistance programs and reminders. Whenever an employee is having difficulties in one area or another, it, reminding them that they are having employee assistance providers, they are benefits that they're eligible for and allowing them to reach out and connect with them. Next slide, please. So um, this is talking about returning to work and how it improves the social determinant of health for employees and we know that maintaining an individual's job skill really enhances the recovery and stabilizes their financial security when they can return to work quickly. So keeping that daily routine helps retain social connections and improves that overall mental well-being. I've worked with employers who um, when somebody wasn't able to return to work, they've supported that individual in um, being able to do volunteer work in the interim just so that they could have that social interaction, get up every day, have a structured routine, um, you know, feel good about having that, that um, structure and, and what they're doing until they can return to work. So that's always very helpful. And then um, accessing health and social care services reduces the negative impact um, of, of those barriers and social determinant. So we talked a lot about um, examples where uh, retain can assist with social determinant support. And thank you, Amy and Michelle for sharing those specific barriers as well as ways to overcome those barriers. I know we shared a lot of information in a short period of time, um, but I personally have been um, fortunate enough to see how retain return to work coordinators not only identify and overcome barriers for workers, but really look at the sustainability of our services. Coordinators have identified needs that a worker may not have now, but they may have in the future um, when they're no longer working with us at Retain. And an example of this is a worker who had um, childcare currently, but it was from a family member who um, lived in a different part of the country part of the year. So the retained return to work coordinator was able to identify that need that would be coming up in a few months and um, then assist with overcoming that barrier before it occurred, thereby allowing the worker to have a plan for sustain sustainable success. So at Retain, we welcome the opportunity to be part of employer solutions to help overcome social determinants. But in addition to us, communicating clearly to employees about their benefits, as well as, like Michelle said, who they need to talk to at the employer is one way to help communicate expectations while they're navigating their injury or illness. As workers, most of us have access to those employee assistance programs that can um, help overcome many of those social determinant barriers. But again, as Michelle mentioned, it's important to remind workers as we often learn about the employee assistance programs during onboarding and annual enrollment, but otherwise it's easy for us to forget about that as a very valuable resource. Our employee screener at Retain is an easy way to scan the QR code, answer three eligibility questions if they're a Kentucky resident, are working or have worked in the past 12 months, and have a medical condition that's not uh, work-related. And then they'll be taken to a screen delete 
contact info and one of our intake coordinators contact them within one business day to schedule an intake. We also refer individuals who are not eligible for retained to the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation via this employee screener. We're here to help and make the process simple to refer so someone can call us at 859-562-3251, email at retain at uky.edu, or visit our website at www.kyretain.org, or as I just shared, use that employee screener as well. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, all of our employment seminar series are available on our Retain Kentucky Media website on YouTube, and today's will be there as well. So please check us out and subscribe to our channel. And with that, um, it doesn't look like there are any questions in our chat box, um, but we really appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you so much to Amy and Michelle for sharing your expertise and a, a small glimpse into how uh, return to work coordinators at Retain can help employees overcome social determinant barriers. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.